Welcome back to the Der Show. I hope uh, you all had a Merry Christmas or the Merry uh, Happy Last Days of Hanukkah or whatever holidays you celebrate. I guess we all celebrate New Year's uh, uh, coming up. A lot has happened, obviously, since our, our last uh, show. Um, first, I want to say a word about Merry Christmas to the Christians who live um, in the Middle East. Um, and they are a victim these days of a kind of cultural uh, genocide. Um, when Israel was first established, um, the number of Christians in Lebanon, for example, was very extensive. I mean, the government of Lebanon was always divided into a Christian head of state or prime minister and a Muslim head of state or prime minister. It was a very very divided country. Um, the Gaza Strip had had Christians, uh, Christian Arabs, um, Greek Orthodox, um, um, Copts, um, and of course Bethlehem. I first went to Bethlehem in 1970 uh, in the the winter at Christmas of 1970. It was just beautiful, you know, where where Christianity all began. Um, uh, Israel had just won control of Bethlehem during the um, 67 war. Before that, obviously, no Jews were allowed in, in Bethlehem. Um, but the Bethlehem of 1970 was, was beautiful. It was a, a great Christian event. And then, of course, what happened is, let's start with Lebanon. Lebanon just became... Christian Rhine, uh, like Juden Rhine, uh, the Christians, many of them were forced to leave. And the Christians who lived in Gaza were, were forced to leave. The Muslim extremists uh, in Hamas didn't want Christians, and they were forced to leave. And, and many Christians who made their home in Bethlehem for centuries um, were forced to leave. The only place in that area that Christians could really celebrate Christmas without any kind of fear was Israel. In Israel, Christians are exactly equal under the law to, to Jews and Muslims. And so Christian cities like Nazareth and Bethlehem, um, particularly the ones who were within Israel itself, like Nazareth, of course, um, the Christians thrived there. Their numbers increased. The only place in the Middle East where Christian numbers increased, that part of the Middle East, was in Israel itself. And so, you know, don't talk to me about genocide against the Palestinians. The number of Palestinians have increased during this alleged genocide. The only groups that have decreased have been Christian Arabs, and they have decreased not as a result of anything Israel did. Israel welcomed them as a result of what Muslim Arabs have done uh, uh, to them. So Merry Christmas to the few remaining uh, Christians who, who live in Gaza and uh, the remaining Christians who live in Bethlehem and who live in, in Lebanon. Um, may your numbers increase, but it's unlikely uh, as long as Hamas is in control. The other two things that happened, we've already talked about. I just wanted to touch on them briefly before we get to the topic of the day. One increasing, increasing opposition to the Colorado Supreme Court's uh, four to three decision, um, taking President Trump off the ballot, even, even CNN and the New York Times and usual suspects, not all of them, obviously, but many of them have said, well, well, wait a minute, you can't really read the 14th Amendment that way. That is not historically correct. Um, we were hoping maybe that you could come up with a decision that would make sense keeping Trump off the ballot, but this one doesn't. So there's an acknowledgement. And then the third story that we're going to be following in, in days and weeks to come probably is whether or not President Gay at Harvard can can remain on. There are increasing allegations of, um, of plagiarism, including one very, very serious one, uh, where she borrowed whole ideas and words and sentences without even a citation or a mention 
of the person from whom she borrowed the work. That's a very serious charge of plagiarism. Uh, some of the others are not uh, particularly uh, serious, but we'll see what the university does. Harvard doesn't often apologize or change its mind. So she may very well stay on. A lot of people I know are predicting that her days are numbered, but I know Harvard very well, and I know they stick to their mistakes. And uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens. So let's turn to today's uh, subject. It may sound a little dramatic, but Iran has technically declared war on, on the United States. Uh, it has uh, sent drones and rockets and others attacking American targets. And the most recent instance, an American soldier was critically injured. We, we hope he lives. We hope he's okay. But critical injuries uh, are life-threatening. And, and, and this comes from Iran. It, and it's an act of war. It's called casus belli. It's the kind of act which under international law would permit the United States to literally destroy all military bases in Iran. Because remember that under international law, if you respond to a military attack, even if it's a small military attack, there is no such concept as proportionality in terms of the attack itself. Proportionality only relates to the number of civilians anticipated being killed. But if the attack is directed only against military targets, against army bases, against you know, uh, army jets, army boats, or anything like that. There is no concept of proportionality. You can use overwhelmingly disproportionate force uh, to deter and punish and repel future um, uh, attacks and destroy the opponent's ability to wage war against you. And so there's no doubt about a few propositions. Number one, Iran waged war on the United States. It attacked American targets quite deliberately. Number two, it did it through proxies and surrogates, to be sure. It did it through the Houthis in, in Yemen. It did it through Hezbollah in uh, Lebanon. It did it through Hamas in, in Gaza and through other uh, Iranian surrogates. You know, Iran sits back in Tehran, laughs all its way to the bank, uh, collects money from oil revenues, doesn't send its own soldiers to harm's way. It sends Palestinians and it sends Lebanese and it sends Yemenis uh, all to uh, to die in the name of in the name of Iran. But under international law, that doesn't matter. If Iran is behind the attacks on the United States, and they are without a doubt, they supply the arms, they supply the training, they often give intelligence and logistical aid. And in many instances, they are the ones who schedule the attacks and do everything but carry them out. Um, and so all these attacks are attributable to Iran as a matter of law and as a matter of diplomacy and as a matter of politics and, of course, as a matter of morality. So the United States is entitled to attack back what did they do the other day? They had a small attack. They attacked, yes, a drone facility and, you know, may have killed a few terrorists and hopefully not, but perhaps some civilians. Iran says yes. The United States says no about civilians, but we'll only know as time goes on. But the United States is entitled to wage a full-fledged war against uh, Iran. They're not going to do it, but um, right now, under law, they are entitled, and they don't have to, under international law, when you're attacked, you don't have to attack the people who attacked you, that is, the military unit that attacked you. You can attack any unit, military unit, from the country that attacked you. And, of course, Iran is the one that attacked them. So it would be perfectly lawful for the United States to now target um, Iran's growing um, ability to develop nuclear arsenal. We now know also from material within the atomic energy community that Iran is, has gone back to building uh, a, a nuclear weapons system. It slowed it down for a while um, earlier in this year, but intelligence now shows that it's uh, continuing and it's building toward a point where it could 
easily move toward developing a nuclear arsenal. If it attacked now, would it be too early? It's much better to be early than late. Um, I just think the analogy to Nazi Germany in the 1930s, uh, I think if Churchill had been prime minister, they might have attacked too early and destroyed the German war machine and killed a few thousand people in the process, but it would have prevented the emergence of Nazism. Instead, they acted too late. By the time they acted, Germany was the most powerful country in all of Europe, and it was able to overrun Europe and conquer virtually all of Europe until D-Day, um, June 6, 1944, when finally the United States and England were able to cross uh, into Europe and, and, and fight back. But between really 1939 and 1944, Europe was in the hands of the Nazis because the Western countries, particularly England and France, waited too long. By the time they waited, it was too late. And that's a lesson, I think, for uh, Americans now. Um, uh, Americans are entitled to destroy the nuclear reactor. This is a good time to do it because Iran has attacked us and we're entitled to respond. Israel, too, has the right to respond. There's no doubt that Iran has declared war on Israel. It says so. You know, it declares Israel to be the small devil, the United States the big devil. It is behind Hezbollah's attacks on Israel. <coughs> Excuse me. Still, still a little lingering cold. Thank you all, by the way, for your good wishes. Um, and it, um, uh, it, it, uh, no doubt, uh, Iran was behind um, uh, these attacks on Israel, uh, behind the attacks that the uh, Houthi have now openly declared that they're targeting Israel uh, in sympathy with the people of of Gaza. No, they're doing it in sympathy with the people of Iran. And of course, Iran couldn't care less about the Palestinians uh, in Gaza. They care only about their own hegemony over the uh, Middle East. So what we're seeing is two countries in the Middle East against whom Iran has declared war. Technically, technically, uh, both have been victimized by what I told you, to use the fancy Latin term, casus belli, acts of war, causes of war, acts of war. And the international law and the law of war is very clear. Both Israel and the United States are entitled now to destroy Iran's uh, nuclear weapons um, capacity, and, and they should do it. Um, it comes with risks. If the United States and Israel do it together, the risks are far, far less great. It would widen the war. But right now, the war is widened on one side. Iran has widened the war. It is attacking shipping in the Red Sea. It is attacking American uh, soldiers. And the United States is narrowing the war. That makes very little sense. You don't want to widen a war initially. But here you have the war has been widened by Iran, again, using the Red Sea as its own little lake uh, and, and, and through the Houthis controlling. In fact, it's already affected commerce because we know that various commercial companies and some nations have said, we're going to stop our shipping going through the Red Sea. We'll send them around Africa. Uh, the long way to avoid being hit by Houthi rockets, that, that already is an act of war. A closing areas to naval shipping is an act of war. Um, remember, the Six-Day War started that way when Egypt closed the Gulf of Aqaba to Israeli shipping. And international law is very clear on that issue. Uh, and so Israel alone, or in combination with the United States, hopefully in combination with the United States, could uh, easily um, take action militarily against Iran, the head of the snake. And, you know, even if Israel manages to destroy the Hamas leadership, and I think it's very questionable whether they'll be able to uh, do it, that's the body of the snake. Uh, Iran will simply get other surrogates. They'll create new organizations to attack Israel. Um, if Israel wants to really be safe in the area 
and wants to continue the David Accords uh, and the Abraham Accords and all the good things that have happened in making peace, it has to get rid of the, the nations and the groups that are barriers to peace. Iran, number one. Then it's surrogates, Hezbollah, Hamas, the Houthis. These are bad actors. These are people who endanger the peace of the world. These are the people who cause civilian deaths, by the way. Uh, the Houthis and the uh, uh, other groups in, in, in Afghanistan and Iraq and Lebanon have caused so many more civilian deaths than have been attributable to Israel. Uh, let's assume, let's assume that the Hamas health authority is correct, that 20,000 people have been killed, half of whom are probably terrorists. But let's assume those figures are correct. Those are a small fraction of the number of uh, Arabs who killed other Arabs, Muslims who killed other Muslims in warfare. But nobody cares when an Arab kills an Arab. Nobody cares when a Muslim kills a Muslim. The only outrage occurs is when Israel or the United States kill an Arab or a Muslim. But dead babies, whether their death has been caused by Arabs or by Israelis, you know, that, that, that shouldn't be the, the, critical, the critical fact. But the world, the, both the Arab world, the Muslim world, and the international community couldn't care less when Arabs kill Arabs. People talk about devaluing Palestinian life. It's not Israel that devalues Palestinian lives. Israel values every Palestinian civilian. It's the Arabs themselves who devalue Arab lives when Arabs kill Arabs and when Muslims kill Muslims. Hundreds of thousands have been killed in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in the Syrian civil war, in the Yemen civil war. Hundreds of thousands not 20,000, which is probably way an exaggeration. Hundreds of thousands, most of them are civilians, but you don't see pictures of dead Arab babies unless the media can say, a Jew did it, a Jew did it. That was done by Israel. That was done by the nation state of the Jewish people. Why that discrimination? Why that double standard? Why doesn't the Arab world care when Arabs kill Arabs. It reminds me a little bit about police activities in the United States. You know, there's much more attention paid. I understand why, but there is much more attention paid when a white policeman uh, tragically kills, like in the George Floyd case, an African-American. We get far less attention paid when over this weekend in Chicago, Christmas weekend in Chicago, so many African-American People were killed in shootouts and in, in shootings, but black-on-black -black crime, that's a footnote. Uh, but white-on-black crime, that becomes the cause of a creation of diversity, equity, and inclusion bureaucracies at, at, at universities, because it was the killing of George Floyd which gave tremendous impetus to the reckoning that has caused the development of these bureaucracies on college campus. I understand it. I understand the emotions. I understand it. But um, when people are, are killed by people of their own background, ethnicity, color, religion, it matters too. It matters too. And, uh, it, and, and it should matter. Uh, for example, when three Israeli soldiers were killed by Israeli gunfire, friendly fire, you know, it was a horrible thing. Uh, it was, in Israel, it was mourned exactly the same as if they had been killed by Arab gunmen or Muslim gunmen or Hamas gunmen. Life is a life, and there shouldn't be a difference, but there is uh, in the court of public opinion and in the media. If it bleeds, it leads, and if it bleeds differently because of who were the perpetrators and who were the victims, then it leads even more because it exacerbates the, the tensions. And so will the United States and, um, and Israel or will Israel alone 
have to take out Iran's a nuclear weapons program. I guarantee you one thing, no matter how many soldiers Israel loses, and they're losing far too many in Gaza, which is why I was much more in favor of an air war than a ground war, but no matter how many soldiers are lost, no matter how weakened the Israeli um, military may get as the result of Gaza, it will not allow Iran to actually develop a nuclear arsenal. No matter what it takes, it will have to destroy Iran's nuclear arsenal. Just imagine what October 7th would have looked like if Hamas or Hezbollah or the Houthis or any of the surrogate groups of Iran had been given dirty bombs or had been given tactical nuclear devices or had been given anything that could emit a radiation uh, or, or a full nuclear bomb. As Iran has said, Israel is a one bomb state. All that would be needed is one bomb in Tel Aviv and Israel would be destroyed. And Iran has basically said that's its goal to develop nuclear weapons to use against Israel, to destroy Israel. The former president, Rafsanjani, the liberal president, once said, and I quote him in my book, um, war against the Jews. It's doing well, so I hope you uh, have an opportunity to get it and, and read it. But in the book, I talk about these, these issues. And the former president of Iran, Rafsanjani, once said that if we develop nuclear weapons, as they want to, and if we were to drop one bomb on Israel, that would be the end of Israel. Israel would then retaliate and drop many, many bombs and kill many millions of Muslims uh, in Tehran, he said. But the trade-off would be worth it because it would destroy the Jewish state, Israel. And Muslims, there's a billion of us. So we would survive an attack on on Tehran. Uh, when you have the liberal president of a country making those kinds of cost-benefit analysis, uh, you know you can't trust that country with nuclear weapons. So no matter what it takes, Israel alone or with the help of the United States is going to have to prevent Iran from developing a nuclear uh, arsenal. This is the time to do it because Iran has provoked both the United States and Israel legally, morally, diplomatically, and in every other way, and they deserve a response. And the response shouldn't be a small attack on a drone factory somewhere in Iraq, which is what the United States did. It should be an all-out attack, not on Iran. We're not yet talking about regime change, although that would be the ideal solution for the Iranian people who would welcome it. But I'm talking about a surgical attack on Iran's nuclear weapons program, which is close at this point to becoming weaponized. So I'm not a warmonger. I'm a peacenik. I like peace. But sometimes, as Ecclesiastes says, to everything there is a season. This is the season to make sure that Iran cannot become a superpower terrorist, the first one in our history, a superpower terrorist with nuclear weapons capable of being used by its terrorist surrogates. And so I'm hoping that the United States and Israel are thinking along these lines and not just responding by saying, well, we'll have a little tit for tat response. They, they critically injure an American, will critically injure an Iranian. No, that's not that's not the answer. The only thing the mullahs respect is overwhelming power. We have it. We should use it. All right. Let's turn to some letters. Huh. Don't you think the judges in Raskin know what is actually in the Constitution? And they use only the words that benefit their cause. No, that's, of course, right. The, the ideal um, example of that is leaving out Clause 5 of the, fifth, of the 14th Amendment that says... Congress has the ability and only Congress to enforce this statute. And it doesn't give that power of self-enforcing or enforcing by, by the state courts. Uh, professor, are you familiar with a man named Norm Eisen? I am. Uh, who founded a group called Cruz, C-R-E-W, 
It has been reported that Eisen had a role in getting Trump off the Colorado ballot. It doesn't surprise me. Eisen's a brilliant guy. He used to be United States ambassador to the Czech Republic. I know. I stayed in the ambassador's house with my wife and my granddaughter. We are friends. Uh, he was my research assistant at Harvard. Jamie Raskin was my student. I am not to blame for their current views on anything, but I hopefully am responsible for making them a little smarter by encouraging them to think creatively. And, you know, I always have mixed feelings about students who've done very good things, which I disagree with, whether they be people like Norm Eisen and, and, and Jamie Raskin, or to the left of me, or Ted Cruz, who's to the right of me. Um, I have an element of pride in both and an element of criticism and, and concern about both. So, wow. Professor, what is the punishment for a Supreme Court member who broke the law? Can they be disbarred? No. No, judges have judicial immunity, and um, they are entitled to make mistakes. I think uh, an English wag once said, everybody in Great Britain is presumed to know the law except her Majesty's, judge, Majesty, her Majesty's judges who have a court of appeals set over them to set them right. So that's why we have courts of appeals to correct judges, not disbarment or prisons. Uh, great analysis. Thank you. It is my understanding that the Northern Republicans essentially extorted the ratification of the 14th Amendment by the Southern states as the price of readmission to the Union and therefore to representation in Congress. I hope you get over your cold. Thanks. I'm, I'm mostly over it. Uh, of course, that's right. Uh, the 14th, 13th, 14th, 15th, Amendment, 15th Amendments were part of our peace process. And it's unthinkable that the framers of the 14th Amendment would have said, well, let's leave it to the Colorado courts to decide. Let's leave it to Virginia, Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, South Carolina, North Carolina. Let's leave it to our enemies. They'll decide who the next president's going to be. Absurd. It was obviously calculated very clearly to be left to the Congress. That's what the 14th Amendment says, and that's what it means. And the fact that the Colorado court uh, misread the 14th Amendment and said basically that the, ex the, the, the disqualification provisions are self-executing. No, they're not self-executing. Uh, they need congressional authorization. You need a set of procedures for how this gets invoked, and only Congress can do it. Colorado courts, which did it, were not authorized to do it. And I think the Supreme Court will so hold. Ah. Uh, Oh, this is a flattering. You were one of the most brilliant legal minds of our time. I love when you said, of course I would defend Jack the Ripper. <laughs> Everyone is entitled to a lawyer. We must stop picking and choosing who gets to have rights. That last sentence was for the leftists. Well, I think it could also be applicable to some people on the right. So many people believe rights for me, but not for thee. Rights are designed for my side of the political spectrum, not for everybody. Uh, the reason I have so few friends is because I apply the Constitution equally. Sometimes it helps the right. Sometimes it hurts the right. Sometimes it helps the left. Sometimes it hurts. Sometimes it helps the Democrats. That's not my concern. My concern is applying the Constitution equally to all. The Colorado decision is indeed legally incoherent and lawless. The 14th Amendment was indeed blatantly misapplied. The Colorado Supreme Court's majority declowned it, beclowned itself. Okay, don't know. Um, president, a uh, professor, it is being reported that President Gay at Harvard had plagiarized material in 60% of the articles and papers she had written. I think that's an overstatement. Uh, she was given tenure, but at that time only had published four articles, which is an extremely low bar. That's right. She is the face of DEI at Harvard. That's right. Almost 20% of the early commits to Harvard have declined not to go. I don't think that's correct. I don't think we know the data yet. After all, the early admits were just sent out in, I think, mid-December, and there's no deadline, uh, immediate deadline, so I don't think we have any idea how many of the early admits declined. I suspect it's almost none. When people, first of all, when you commit for early admission, you commit to go. But second, when people get into Harvard, they generally accept. Now, the number of applications have gone down, and that may reflect what's going on with, um, with President Gay and with the DEI. Uh, we'll see. It's a work in progress. There's no doubt that Harvard's reputation has been seriously tarnished by President Gay and by DEI, and there are a number of us who are fighting back. 
Uh, let's see if we prevail. See you tomorrow.